Well, good morning, everyone. I hope you enjoyed the little start to this uh, webinar. We are excited to have a good time together and really learn some wonderful information. So welcome to the Cincinnati USA Regional Chambers Leadership Now series. We have created a series as an extension of our Chamber's leadership programs to really help you lead during this unique time. I'm Amy Thompson, uh, Leadership Program Senior Director, and I'm thrilled you're with us. We at the Chamber have been really focused on how do we help you as a leader and how do we help your business through this time? If you haven't had a chance, we highly encourage you to engage with us, whether it's our daily emails or visit our resource hub so that we can help you out. So let's talk a little bit about how we will navigate today. You all have joined using the listen only mode with your microphones muted. If you have questions for our expert, please feel free to uh, ask those questions in our Q&A window. We also, as you can see, have the chat function going. This is a place where you can interact with the other participants on the call. Feel free to post an article, a link, a comment to build off of what Holly is sharing and the conversation. We'll cover as much as we can in this one hour, but we will also post it tomorrow on our website in case you have to step out or are not able to finish the entire webinar. It will be available for you tomorrow on our website as well. So we are so thrilled, so thrilled to be working with Xavier Leadership Center. Thank you so much to our friends over at Xavier Leadership Center. We've truly enjoyed working with you uh, to pull this webinar together today. So let me tell you a little bit about them. For over 50 years, as a part of Xavier's University Williams College of Business, the Leadership Center has delivered high quality leadership and business professional development programs for global, regional, local organizations and individuals. They offer both organizational individual world-class programs, which help professionals develop the skills they need to succeed. As well, they also have invaluable advisory and coaching services to organizations looking to take their business to the next level. Truly a perfect fit for um, our work here at the Chamber. We love uh, connecting with you all and collaborating. So thrilled to be have Xavier Leadership Center with us today. We have a wonderful leader and facilitator uh, that is going to be here as our really our host today. Our guest is Holly O'Driscoll. Holly is a Xavier Leadership Center facilita facilitator and an industry expert in the field of human-centered innovation and development. After 20 years at P&G, Holly built a reputation as a master human-centered innovation strategist, trainer, and facilitator. She's the founder and CEO of Ampersand Innovation, a design thinking human-centered innovation consultancy focused on unleashing the potential of people and the ideas through workshops, design sprints, and leadership development. So Holly, thank you, thank you so much for being with us today. I also want you to know she's actively working on her own book, so stay tuned. Holly has great things uh, to share with all of us. So Holly, I know you have incredible content prepared for today, but I also know that you wanted to start off with just a fun little chart that you've put together that, that lets all of us really know what's happening during these webinars. So give us a little insight there. Yeah, thanks so much, Amy. Really excited to be with everyone today. And in the spirit of human centeredness, which is really the underpinning of human centered design, human centered innovation, I thought I would start off with this pie chart that really gives us a snapshot of what's happening when we all join a Zoom meeting. So have a look around the, the, the slices here and see what's showing up for you today, right? So it's totally possible that, that you're wondering, holy cow, right, has my neck always looked like that? <laughs> <laughs> or, you know, what's it going to take to get my kids out of the bedroom? Fortunately, three of my, three of my four kids are still asleep um, upstairs. So, yeah, and the fact that we're only going to spend 2% of our attention really focused on the meeting content. I know that. You know that. We're all on the same page. And as Amy mentioned, you can watch the video later if there's some things that, that show up in your Zoom experience that you need to come and tend to, right? So, you know, I empathize with that as I'm coming to you from my home this morning, and many of you are probably also dialing in from your home. So thanks so much for doing so, and good morning. 
Holly, thank you. That's a great way to start. You're right. It's um, this whole, whole new Zooming is, is a different world and we're all getting used to it. But let's really jump into the content. You've put together some incredible resources for us today to really think about this is an incredible time of ambiguity. So give us some context and background on how should we be navigating and thinking about this time, just this ambiguous time? Yeah, it's a great question, Amy. And I think one of the things that really stands out is um, none of us were trained to lead during a pandemic, right? None of us. This isn't what we learned in business school. This isn't what our professional experience has kind of raised us to, to figure out. Um, we're really kind of figuring it out as we go. And to give yourself a little bit of grace on nobody has the answer and hence the, the navigating ambiguity, right? How do we work through that? The other thing I think is really important is that um, there are times when we're not gonna get it right. <laughs> and how do we continue to, to propel and to push even though we're gonna have some hiccups along the way? And you know, how do we step into that space and say, wow, how are we gonna, gonna go forth and um, really step into this space? And giving ourselves the, the opportunity to lead anyway, even when there's not a path, is really, really important. So that's the third point on navigating ambiguity that I wanted to make, right? And stepping into this space where, boy, it's really uncomfortable, and it's been really uncomfortable for weeks. It's not days now, it's turning into months. And that's probably not going to change anytime soon. So how do we step in and lead anyway? Okay, so what I'd like to do, hopefully you've got a, a sheet of paper and maybe a pen or pencil handy. Um, would love to kick off with an exercise. So um, all you're going to see on the screen is this instruction, which is grab a sheet of paper and draw what it looks like to make toast. The only constraint I'm going to offer you is no words, right? So we'll, we'll turn on some music for I don't know, about a minute and a half, two minutes, and give you an opportunity to sketch out what does it look like to make toast, whatever that means to you. And then what I'd like to have you do is to share some reactions of what shows up on your sketch in the chat box, and Amy can play those back at the end of the, the exercise time. Okay, we've got some things popping into the chat box on um, some reflections on the toast exercise. So Amy, you wanna share some of those with us? Sure, sure. I, what I love is that uh, we certainly all have a couple different views of toast here. So Molly's got um, an attempt at a toaster and then she had two wine glasses clicking. Love that. Uh, let's see, Tara, she had it burnt from leaving it in too long. And I, I personally was feeling a little avocado this morning. And uh, Cinder had some jam, butter, golden brown, four on my toaster oven. Mm -hmm. And then uh, Annalisa had an English muffin. Alicia, uh, oh, that sounds good. Now, I, now I'm really getting hungry, has been making bread. So hers is of kneading. So yeah. a couple different things for sure are coming in. Great examples. Yeah, thanks to everyone who contributed commentary in the chat box. So next slide. 
So I suspect some of the things that ended up in your sketch resembled um, a bit of what you want to keep clicking through the, yeah, there you go, the images on there. So maybe some of you had a toaster. Um, maybe some of you had a toaster oven that was mentioned as well. I've seen people make their toast in a skillet, maybe like a grilled cheese. Um, a couple folks in the world over an open flame. And then um, I love that every once in a while we do get somebody saying that champagne glass is clinking or wine glass is clinking. And why is this exercise meaningful? Um, I think there's a lot of value in the idea that toast has five letters. And yet we end up with very different images of what this looks like, right? And um, how do we juggle that sense of ambiguity? Because if it's happening with toast, it's happening with more complex things in our businesses as well, right? Whether those are our strategies, our action plans, our communication vehicles, and how do we drive for some clarity as we go down this path? Um, so some lessons from the toast exercise. Why did I share that with you? Two reasons. One is to highlight the ambiguity of a, a word that has five letters. The other thing is to give you a tool or a, an opportunity to use something back with your team. So it's a great way, a great exercise to kick off a conversation on what are our assumptions? What are some of the things that, that are showing up as ambiguous that maybe we haven't really thought about? What are some different interpretations here? What are some other ways to go about this? So maybe an, an approach you'd like to go back and use with your team. Again, I think we did that in under three minutes. So really, really fast. So moving on, on navigating ambiguity, there's three points that I want to talk about today. And we're going to offer some tools and opportunity for you to work on an exercise kind of at each step. So the first one is really driving the sense of self-awareness. And so what does that mean? And often you hear in leadership that um, it's really hard to serve others until you've kind of worked on yourself. And I think in times of ambiguity, one of the things that we see is um, we bring a lot of our own baggage to whatever scenario we're in, right? Um, because we're sitting in this space of high stress and how do we know what we're feeling before we can jump in and really start to map out what we need to do next? So the second point I wanna talk about is when we think about ambiguity, we have kind of two choices. We can choose to make it bigger, amplify that ambiguity, right? Or we can make it better. Right? What happens when we're stepping into these spaces? And we can choose to really make it better by alleviating some of that ambiguity for ourselves and for our teams. And getting intentional about this choice um, is something that we'll talk about as we click through today. So third point that we'll talk about is the importance of choosing clarity over certainty. And I'll unpack what that means as well as we move ahead. So let's jump into self-awareness. So here's a snapshot of um, some articles from Harvard Business Review that have shown up in their online feed in the past year and a half. And I think it ties in so nicely to the topic of nav navigating ambiguity. Certainly the one in the center, managing when the future is unclear. This came out more than a year ago. So this is not new, but it's really important to, to dial into, hey, it's an amplified stress at this point. And this space for leading organizational change and being connected to empathy Self-awareness is empathy for ourselves, right? What does it look and feel like to be us in that moment? And what are we trying to do? In this space for humility and, and arrogance, how can we be clear, but maybe not be so certain about what the future does hold? So these are some examples of, hey, this has been out swirling for some time, but only now is it really starting to, to rise and um, to be of critical importance as we continue to lead in our organizations. So let's dive into self-awareness. Next slide. So I want to introduce a tool um, that I use quite a bit in my design thinking practice. And when I think about design thinking, that's a human-centered approach to solving problems. And often solving those problems are for someone else, right? Someone else, like a stakeholder, maybe, maybe one of the people on our teams, maybe a leader in our organization, maybe a customer, a consumer. What I find is that it also works really well when we're trying to make sense of what's going on for us, right? So when you think about the, the importance of really driving that self-awareness, what are we thinking? What are we feeling, right? What are we saying? What are we doing? So some of the questions that are showing up here are prompts 
for you to explore what does that moment look like for you? And if you think about pain and gain at the bottom, pain or what are some of those stresses, some of those barriers that are showing up for you right now? When you think about gain, what are those things that are really kind of silver linings, these, these opportunities to do things that maybe you thought weren't possible previously that are really offering these unexpected moments of delight? So next slide. So some questions to ask yourself as you think about driving towards self-awareness. Um, what am I feeling? And how do you drive that clarity forward? Uh, what am I assuming that may or may not be true? And how important it is to kind of pause and have us, have us sit in that space of, wow, what am I bringing into this space? Um, and then third point around, what are our prior experiences doing to influence our response or our reaction to any given situation? What's the narrative? What's the story that we're writing based on our past experiences? And so here's another exercise for you to go and do. Um, and we're gonna turn on the music and pause for a bit um, to give you the opportunity to do this such that at the end of our session, you'll have a, a very clear sense of your own self-awareness in this moment. And so this is a simple two by two, right? If you can draw kind of an X axis and a Y axis with yourself at the center. And what I like about this is the other one certainly is fancy for PowerPoint and there's value in using that in that orientation. But sketching out this two by two is a really easy way to get in touch with yourself, with someone on your team, with a leader above you, with um, a stakeholder of any kind. And so let me simplify that for you even further. So if you look at the side on the right, the thinks and feels, what I like about this is that if you were to imagine a profile, so I'm gonna turn my head for a second. The profile shot is the stuff on the inside. What am I thinking in my head? What am I feeling in my heart? And then the stuff on the other side is what's being said. So what are the words that are coming out of your mouth? And then the doing is the behaviors. So I'm gonna turn back. So if you think about kind of what's happening on the inside, what's coming out, right? What signals are you sending out? It's a really easy way to remember the mechanics of the empathy map. So what I'd like for you to do is pull out your pencil and paper again and sketch out this two by two and capture some of the things that you're thinking about, that you're feeling. Maybe some things that you find yourself saying or doing in this moment to really heighten your sense of self-awareness to more effectively manage your ambiguity. So I think we'll take about a minute and a half, two minutes again um, with some light music and go ahead and, and jump into your exercise. And again, as you think about your exercise and wrap that up, if there are some things that pop for you, some things that emerge, go ahead and capture those in the chat box and Amy can share those back to us in a moment as well. stories that I can't explain I leave my heart open but it stays right here empty for days She told me in the morning she don't feel the same about us in her bones Seems to me that when I die these words will be written on my stone and I'll be gone, gone tonight The ground beneath my feet is open wide The way that I've been holding on too tight With nothing in between The story of my life, I take her home I dive all night to keep her warm in time It's Stays right here in its cage I 
know that in the morning now, see us in the light upon the hill. Although I am broken, my heart is untamed still. To share things that you learned about yourself from the experience of using the empathy map to drive your self-awareness go ahead and, and add those to the chat um, we don't have to mention your your name in the share out um, but really important to to think about wow how do you use this to better get in touch with with what you're feeling so amy anything popping in the chat window Sure, uh, just a good reminder for people to go ahead and use that. Oh, good, some things are starting to come in. Um, work on a plan to move people forward with empathy. That's just a great suggestion. Um, and then some other comments, it was just nice to get it out. And, and I think that's true. It, I was starting to capture that um, I often think of this time as a bit of a roller coaster. There are times when I am up at a peak and excited about the possibilities, but I'll be 100% honest, there are moments that I am down in that valley and I get really nervous, um, whether it's for health, safety, or other things. So it is a up and down. Um, let's see, then there's also some comments of I'm not necessarily aligning my thinking and feeling with my saying and doing. And I think that's so true we have to be empathetic for ourselves right now of this is such a tricky time mm -hmm. uh, another comment of a substantial gap between what i think and also what i'm doing we're seeing a little bit of a trend of that i think that's so true um th comment that this is a nice tool to raise awareness around triggers and and flips uh, let's see it, this definitely helps you be more aware and more in alignment with your EQ. And I have to remember that the rest of my staff is not where I am in any given situations. As leaders, we are often further ahead than our employees. Gosh, I, I love that one because there are so many times that we've been thinking about something and working on something for so long and we think, everybody's right here with me. Aren't you with me on this? Um, but really, we need to give people a chance to be where they are and be in exactly. them for that moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'm really excited to hear that that um, that was a valuable exercise. And what I think is really useful is that it challenges us to do what I call making the invisible visible, right? So how do we get that stuff out of our head and onto the paper such that we can do something with it versus just have it swimming, swimming around in our minds um, kind of not serving us well. So thanks for everyone who offered some commentary in the chat box. Feel free to use this. And one of the things that's gonna land in the um, follow-up link is a um, empathy map, like the one that I had shared on the previous slide, such that if you wanna send it around to your team and have a conversation around what are we collectively thinking and feeling, right? Um, it's certainly easier to do in person on a whiteboard <laughs> in, a, in a conference room, but you can throw this up on a screen and you know, share it in a PowerPoint and start to add some, some text boxes to it as things pop up or give people an opportunity to add some of those things as they go. So it um, works really well on a Google slide that way if you wanna have people contribute in, in that orientation. So some things to go and do um, to really make sense of what we're feeling both as individuals and teams and ultimately enterprises. So thanks for, for jumping in with that exercise. We're gonna move on and talk about the ways to, to make it bigger or make it better, right? As we think about ambiguity. And I would say in general, um, our goal, our intention is to make it better. So next slide. Um, but often we find ourselves kind of stepping into this space of turning that, that maybe small fire into a bonfire. Um, sometimes we end up making it bigger. So sometimes, especially in times of stress, we allow our insecurities to really take over. Um, what does that result in? Sometimes micromanaging others. I read an article on LinkedIn this week that talked about how remote work is a nightmare for micromanagers. And my immediate response was, oh, Interesting. I mean, how often have, have micromanaging resulted in nightmares for employees? So, you know, let's talk about that for a minute and, and get intentional around what are we afraid of? Why are we micromanaging people anyway? And um, does that behavior in its own right create and reinforce fear and therefore drive more ambiguity? Um, and then this last point around really having a narrow mindset. 
um, Carol Dweck out of Stanford has a book called Mindset and she talks about fixed versus growth. And fixed mindset is what she describes as a bit more narrow on, you know, this is the one way, the only way that you can do this, um, the only way this problem can be solved versus a growth mindset, which is a little more expansive and lives in this space of possibility. Um, and so ambiguity is often enhanced by this narrow mindset where if there's only a myopic lens or one view, um, that becomes a real challenge to maybe some of the alternate points of view that are living as you know, additional possibilities as we go forward. So ways we make ambiguity bigger, lining up here, maybe some other points you wanna share with your team in that space. But there's also ways we can make ambiguity better and try to um, really make it easier for people to, to juggle multiple paths. Um, and what does that start with? You as a leader, creating this sense of, of um, what's known as psychological safety. So there's a great book called The Fearless Organization by a Harvard professor named Amy Edmondson. And she talks about the importance of really creating these environments where it's safe to raise your hand with an alternate point of view, where it's safe to ask unpopular questions. And boy, now has that ever been more important than, than in this moment. And so ways we make ambiguity better is to create the space of psychological safety where we can ask questions and where we as leaders can ask some of those difficult questions as well, such that we can model that for others. And then this space of being vulnerable and open. Um, I love what you shared, Amy, around, hey, sometimes it feels like a roller coaster. Even those kinds of, of comments in a team meeting signal vulnerability and hey i'm feeling the same kind of things i remember um, two weeks ago i felt like i had hit a wall and i only had about a, a productive two or three hours i felt like that week because i was just done with all of this and then you know, last week came back for sure and um, this week I've, I've had better energy than i've had in a while and so when you think about um, really stepping into those moments of vulnerability, you're creating space for other people to be vulnerable too. And then when you think about suspending judgment, um, it's not saying, oh, you hit a wall, there must be something wrong with you. That's not the, the way to make ambiguity better, right? You suspend the judgment by going, oh, wow, hitting a wall is a really tough thing. Let's talk about it some more. And can you tell me more about that? And then stepping into the space of, of challenging assumptions. I talked a little bit around that um, earlier, but when you think about assumptions, it's really important to state them before you're able to challenge them. Um, and a great conversation to have with your team is to talk about what are our assumptions in this moment? Are we assuming that we're gonna come back to the office together next week or next month or next year, right? What are some of those assumptions that show up? And when we talk about it, we're making that invisible stuff now visible and therefore we're making the ambiguity better. So I've got a quick video I wanna share with you as well. Um, and it's about two minutes and 40 seconds. So it's one of the shortest TED Talks that I've come across and one of my favorites as well. So another thing that you can share with your team, it's a great way to kick off a team meeting and talk about, wow, what are our assumptions? What are some of the things that we are bringing into this that may or may not be true? So if we can queue up the video, we'll watch that and then do our... <laughs> So imagine you're standing on a street anywhere in America and a Japanese man comes up to you and says, uh, excuse me, what is the name of this block? And you say, I'm sorry, well, this is Oak Street, that's Elm Street, this is 26th, that's 27th. And he says, okay, but what is the name of that block? And you say, well, blocks don't have names. Streets have names. Blocks are just the unnamed spaces in between streets. He leaves a little confused and disappointed. So now imagine you're standing on a street anywhere in Japan. You turn to a person next to you and say, excuse me, uh, what is the name of this street? And they say, oh, well, that's block 17 and this is block 16. And you say, okay, but what is the name of this street? And they say, well, streets don't have names. Blocks have names. Just look at Google Maps here. There's block 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19. All of these blocks have names and the streets are just the unnamed spaces in between the blocks. And you say, okay, then, how do you know your home address? I said, well, easy, this is District 8, there's Block 17, 
house number one. They say, okay, but walking around the neighborhood, I noticed that the house numbers don't go in order. He said, of course they do. They go in the order in which they were built. The first house ever built on a block is house number one. The second house ever built is house number two. Third is house number three. It's easy. It's obvious. So I love that sometimes we need to go to the opposite side of the world to realize assumptions we didn't even know we had and realize that the opposite of them may also be true. So for example, there are doctors in China who believe that it's their job to keep you healthy. So any month you are healthy, you pay them. And when you're sick, you don't have to pay them because they failed at their job. They get rich when you're healthy, not sick. In, <laughs> in most music, we think of the one as the downbeat, the beginning of the musical phrase. One, two, three, four. But in West African music, the one is thought of as the end of the phrase, like the period at the end of a sentence. So you can hear it not just in the phrasing, but the way they count off their music. Two, three, four, one. And this map is also accurate. <laughs> <laughs> There's a saying that whatever true thing you can say about India, the opposite is also true. So let's never forget, whether at TED or anywhere else, that whatever brilliant ideas you have or hear, that the opposite may also be true. Domo arigato gozaimasta. Okay, thanks so much for that. And so a really quick um, video to use with your team to open up a conversation around wow, what are some of those assumptions and what stories are we bringing into this moment that may or may not be true? And let's talk about how that can help us alleviate the ambiguity that we're facing in this moment or some of it, right? So what I'd like to do now is offer up a second exercise and give you a little bit of time to reflect and think about a couple of ways you can make ambiguity better as a leader. And so I've offered up some stimulus for that, but maybe that sparked some things for you that um, maybe you want to dive into deeper. And why did I choose one or two ways instead of five or seven? And I think there's value in small steps. Uh, what's one or two things you can do to lead towards the goal that you're, you're aiming for? It's not a whole list, right? Especially now when we've got a lot going on and a lot of, of um, new challenges that perhaps we didn't have a couple of months ago, or maybe they look differently, or maybe they're bigger now um, than maybe they were in the past. So one or two things that you can do to make ambiguity better. And I think we'll use um, one minute for our exercise here. And as things come to you, feel free to throw those into the chat box and we'll share them back as well, such that we can all learn from the things that are showing up for you on the ways that you can make ambiguity better. So we'll do another minute of music. I thought that I've been hurt before But no one's ever left me quite this sore Your words cut deeper than a knife Now I need someone to breathe me back to life Got a feeling that I'm going under but I know that I'll make it out alive If I quit calling you my lover Move on You watch me bleed until I can't breathe Shaking, fighting onto my knees And now that I'm without your kisses I'll be needing stitches Tripping over myself Just like a moth drawn to popping up in the chat box. Oh, you lured me in. I could. Excellent. I, I would have been happy to sing as well, but uh, <laughs> thank you. They, they could be alarming for everyone. So a lot of things, vulnerability. Uh, good. A lot of things, that would be some vulnerability. Um, good things are coming in. Uh, Stop and ask, do not assume others on my team in the same meetings know what I am thinking. That's such a great one. Uh, assumptions, that's the only bad thing, uh, that only bad things are gonna be the result. Another one, call two employees who I miss talking with every day and don't talk about work. I do love that. I think more and more of those just personal connection moments. And then the reality, this could be a time to correct and thrive. Mm -hmm. One-on-one -on -one ambiguity meetings followed by group meetings to identify the core ambiguity. 
just some great comments are coming in. Um, and again, I, I go back to, I love the assumption piece and just really um, understanding where people are coming from. Yeah, I love the comment around really um, meeting people where they are and not assuming they're in the same place as you as well. And um, that maybe they don't necessarily know what you're thinking about. And so how do we collectively say, boy, this is hard and we're all in different parts on the journey. Um, but we're on this journey together. So how do we support each other in that space going forward? Um, I also really like this, this comment around um, talking to people and don't talk about work, right? Because when you think about what makes us really effective as leaders, it's this connection to people and the relationships that we have, right? Our businesses are collections of people that are coming together in service of ideally a common objective, a common goal. And we do that best when our relationships are strong. So I love dialing into what's going on for you as a person. How can you strengthen that relationship in this moment of profound ambiguity? Yeah, so thanks for sharing all of those. Really great. All right, we're gonna move on and talk about clarity over certainty. So, um, one of my wishes is to wake up and look out on a view like this every day. Um, I tend to be a, a water girl and um, am longing for the time when I can get back to the beach, right? <laughs> um, but I think when you think about clarity, it is providing the sense of clarity over certainty that can also help us really navigate this time of ambiguity. And so um, I wanna jump in and talk about some points that I think really are resonating now. Um, let's go to the next slide. That um, Bob Johansson, who works for an organization called the Institute for the Future out in Palo Alto, and I'm, I've had the opportunity to go out there and meet with him and his team a couple of times um, when I was working at P&G. And his new book is really focused on this this topic of full spectrum thinking on um, looking beyond that narrow mindset, right? And, and how do you really look at the world through a sense of possibility? And one of the points he talked about um, in a recent webinar that I attended was this whole concept of the future will reward clarity and punish certainty. So if I think about even things that are happening here locally in our area um, and specifically in Ohio, um, this is a lot of the same feedback that's coming out of you know, the remarks from Governor DeWine, right? Clarity. He's not offering certainty. He's offering a, a, quite a bit of clarity, and often that means saying, I don't know. We're going to figure it out. It might look differently in a month. Um, and how do we signal that we're going to be clear even when it's hard and even when we're loaded with unknowns? But this space for, for in the past, we might have been able to say, yeah, we're going to do that in three months and we're going to be confident it's going to be done. Or we're going to come together as a global team um, one month from now and we'll figure out our next steps on strategy then. Those were things that were certain in the past. We had a lot of, of um, confidence in our ability to deliver those and that's no longer the case. So let me unpack each of these a little bit further. Again, the clarity and certainty. So we'll start with, with clarity. And this is again from, from Bob Johansson from Institute for the Future. So these signals of clarity, he talks about the importance of, of storytelling. And what are the stories that not only we're telling ourselves, but we're sharing out with our organization. Um, and this also really pays keen attention to what are the questions that you have, that we collectively have, right? And to name those back to this making the invisible visible. How can we signal that Boy, we know that there's a lot of questions out there and we're not really sure how to, to go about answering some of them right now, but know that we feel them too, right? That sense of connection and clarity. These stories that demonstrate this, this sense of curiosity and courage. Um, I talked earlier around those alternate points of view and how do you understand what the other people on your team or in your business are feeling and inviting that as well. So how can we all kind of step into this space of, of clarity? And what does that mean? And you'll see this on, on if you're following some of the, the um, Wine with the Wine series, right? Uh, he's really clear around, hey, here's what I don't know and here's what I do. And rather than sugarcoating it and saying, well, um, yeah, I'll get back to you on, you know, here's what we'll go and do next. Or, yeah, I've got that when you don't really have an answer. Being really candid around what you don't know 
increases your, your credibility and your ability to effectively influence because you've been clear, right? And people know what to expect in that space. And so now we'll talk a little bit around these signals of certainty. Um, and these are some things to avoid during this time because they will drive more ambiguity. So this fixed sense of these are the rules or this is gonna happen for sure by when. Um, the absence of curiosity. So how can we bring not only our words, but our body language as we communicate over Zoom right? um, into this space of curiosity? So what might that look like? Right? In the past, you might have had a conversation of, wow, you know, I'm not really sure I agree. Hmm. Right? Maybe you stop there. Or, or on a worst case scenario, maybe it's a, I'm not sure I agree. I think the conversation's over because I'm the leader. That's really not good, right? But if you step into the space and show curiosity and say, I'm not sure I agree. Can you tell me more? Those are the signals of clarity and curiosity that are really important as we start to navigate this space. And when you think about not knowing what you don't know, that can be a problem as well, right? So how can we be really in touch with, hey, I don't know that and I've got the self-awareness to know what I don't know and I'm not gonna step into these spaces without the, the confidence of the information or the clarity that's really needed in this moment. So um, I love this framing of we can be clear and we can not be certain at the same time. And you might think of those as, as being a little bit of, of opposing ideas. And I think a year ago, I would have felt more alignment and agreement with that too on, wow, how can you be clear and not certain? But you can start to see the leaders that are emerging and their, their strength is showing up when they are communicating with clarity, when they are sending these signals, uh, not when they're committing to certainty in a time when there's so many unknowns. So next slide. So some questions to ponder as we think about kind of moving forward and navigating ambiguity, right? Am I taking the time to really build my self-awareness and think about what am I feeling in this moment? How am I showing up, right? This is kind of hitting on the exercise that we had done on the empathy map, right? Am I consciously choosing to make ambiguity bigger or am I making it better? And how do we get crystal clear with intention on how to behave and show up, right? If we haven't planned for how we want to show up in that moment or in that conversation, we're more likely to step into the making it bigger versus making it better space. And then am I modeling for others? Am I creating space? Am I offering psychological safety such that everybody can bring their curiosity and their courage to life in this moment? and ask those questions that are weighing on them or tell a story around, yeah, I hit a wall or, wow, do you remember the time when, you know, just, just I would say 30 minutes ago, my 10 year old showed up and wanted my phone. So, um, you know, I hand that to him. So he stays out of the screen and he goes, and I'm sure you guys are having those same moments right now. We're all trying to do the very best we can. And I think it's important to think about we're at home during a pandemic and we're trying to work we are not working at home as if the plumber is going to come between one and four, right? It's not that kind of dynamic. And so how do we approach that recognizing, again, none of us were trained to, to lead effectively during a pandemic. We're going to get some things wrong. And it's important to step into your leadership anyway, your people and your business. And I would argue even yourself is kind of counting on you to deliver and grow even in this time of stress. So some questions to ponder as we go through. So next slide. Okay, so we've covered three points around navigating ambiguity. The first one on self-awareness um, and using the empathy map tool, both on ourselves and potentially on our teams um, and using that as a, a jumping off point to really dive into what are we feeling in this moment. And the second point was you know, we've got this choice to make it bigger or make it better and we need to be intentional about doing that. And the third around really providing clarity over certainty. So some tools to get you going as you dive into this next phase, right, of um, whatever reopening looks like depending on where you sit, whether that's in a, a business or a school or 
your own, you know, entrepreneurial endeavors, you know, what do those moments look like and how do we navigate this, this really ambiguous and challenging time with confidence and the willingness to learn more about ourselves and our leadership potential every step of the way. Okay. Holly, thank you so much. This is so helpful, especially when we narrow it down to these three primary bullets, that self-awareness. Am I making it bigger or am I making it better? Am I a part of the solution or am I part of the issue or the challenge? And the, that clarity versus the certainty. I'd love to go back to the chat. There were a number of comments that were coming in around vulnerability. Oh, right. Is a really important issue for leaders. There are a number of leaders who feel, I can't let people know how I'm feeling, how I'm showing up. Uh, I, I can't let them know that I'm real. Mm. I would argue that we've moved into a different time and a different day, not just during this pandemic, but over the last several years, leadership is evolving. People on teams are looking for authentic, real, candid leaders who can admit when they mess up, who can admit when they don't know. Those can be really powerful words. And I'd love for you to just talk about the idea of vulnerability a little bit. Oh, it's a great one. And um, for those of you interested in really diving deep into vulnerability, I'd invite you to listen to Brene Brown's new podcast called Unlocking Us. Um, a great resource, and she's really emerged as one of the world's thought leaders on the topic of vulnerability. But being a vulnerable leader signals your humanity. <laughs> and wow, is there been a better time um, in the history of our professional experience, right, to really demonstrate, hey, we're all trying to figure this out. And um, a question I would have for people that are concerned about demonstrating that vulnerability is what are you so afraid of, right? What's the worst thing that could happen? Um, and flip that as well. Maybe something else you want to sketch out on what's the best thing that could happen. Maybe you connect with people in ways you never thought possible because you have moved away from the, I'll call it the company line or the standard bullet points. And you've been able to connect with the audience and the people on your team in ways that, that maybe they've never experienced before. Maybe they're longing for that. I mean, all of the signals in the research say, hey, this is the time to jump in and really humanize our leadership experience. The draconian model of you know, work is, is something that you, you really need to be present in the office for is being challenged and turned on its head, right? I think that's an interesting example. On, you know, my belief is that work is something you do, not a place that you go. But there's a whole lot of people who feel really strongly they need to see their people every morning and make sure that they're doing what they're supposed to do. And why? I mean, that's a, that's a sense of vulnerability in its own right. So how do, we, how do we lead with courage and model for others that this sense of our human connection and our relationships uh, really can, can amplify our effectiveness as a leader and help us stand out and to step into our potential. We're being called to lead and lead differently than perhaps we've ever dreamed or ever been trained to do. And doing so with vulnerability is really, really important. Here's a great comment that just came in and it's, it's a really good one for us to unpack and discuss a little further. It's one thing to be vulnerable with our teams that creates a connection, uh, no doubt. But the question is really around thinking about vulnerability with our bosses or with those that are in leadership roles, there can certainly be a different dynamic there if there's already questions about our abilities. Um, I'd love for you to just talk through that a little bit, Holly. What are your thoughts on being vulnerable with your boss or a board or a group that oversees your work? Mm -hmm. And maybe they already have questions. Yeah, no, I think it's a really great point and I completely agree that they're different, right? So I would say um, it starts kind of early in our, our, our childhood, right? That we are socialized, we are educated, and then we're corporatized to be right. And um, we are expecting the judgment of others. And when you're the leader of that team, you can more confidently step into that space and be vulnerable because um, who on that team is going to say, hold that against you later for being vulnerable? They're not, they don't have that level of power 
in that way. But if you're doing that with leaders, I think it is a, a, an even more vulnerable moment. And maybe you want to start with small steps. But I think it's a signal if you're concerned about stepping into vulnerability with your leadership, that's a signal that maybe the relationship isn't fully founded on trust, right? And how do you start there as well, right? I remember I had um, some really terrific bosses in my, my corporate experience who I could be really vulnerable with, but others that you feel like, yeah, maybe I shouldn't necessarily be as, as transparent or as candid as I'd like to be with others. And those are signals of, of relationship challenges as well, right? So how do we try to, oh, maybe I'll start with some, some small revelation of vulnerability and then see how that goes as a trial balloon and then iterate from there on, on that level of risk. Because I think there is, there is a different level of vulnerability when you're doing that um, with your leaders, particularly if you've got some sensitive relationship issues going on there too. But I would challenge you to not lose sight of that feeling and to try your best to create conditions where the people on your team don't feel afraid to feel to be vulnerable with you, right? So if you're feeling that and carrying that around, how can you say, wow, I'm gonna do everything I can to make sure my people feel like they can be vulnerable because the stronger those connections, the better the business results are gonna be. Holly, thank you. Great, great points there. And it takes me back to some of your earlier comments around um, how, how do we show up as curious leaders? How do we show up with some courage? And, and that, that does take courage when you are showing those vulnerabilities and um, appreciate those comments. I want to thank everyone for being on this call with us today. Great conversation in the chat. I've really enjoyed watching that kind of fly by with all these wonderful comments. Holly, truly you are doing and leading some incredible work. I appreciate that you got us all thinking today and um, I'm sure this will stay with us as you've given us tools and gifts for us to share with others as well. So Holly, thank you for your partnership and a special shout out to XLC, Xavier's Leadership Center. Truly enjoyed working with Carol and Shelly and your and just entire team. You've got an incredible group of leaders there. So thanks again. At the Chamber, just a reminder, we're here for you and your business. If you are not a member, please take a look. We would love to uh, work with you just today and navigate this time, but also well into the future. And hopefully you've enjoyed this conversation and you're thinking about your own leadership. I'd mention that we are also we are moving forward. We know leadership is critical. So if you're interested, we are still going to have We Lead and Leadership Cincinnati and our applications are open right now and we hope you will consider applying. We have a number of other leadership programs that will be coming online here very, very soon. Leadership is needed now more than ever. So each week we, we provide different webinars and hope that you will tune in for us here in the future. We've got a couple great ones that are coming up at Xavier. Please take a look. Uh, I, it's Take Time for You Tuesdays, moderated by Holly, and um, I hope you will continue to learn with Holly. We also have a number that will be coming up, and we'll be sure to send those in our follow-up email to you all as well. So as we sign off today, a special thank you for everyone at XLC and from Cincinnati USA Regional Chamber. We are truly here for you during this time. Stay safe, uh, respect that social distancing, and as we sign off, please go wash your hands. <laughs> Thanks for being with us. Take care. Thanks so much, Amy. Bye, everyone. Thanks, Holly.